Right, so social investment, we've heard about its birth. Ten years old, it's uh, puberty beckons. Uh, talking of incubation and all these things, we're going to hear now from Sir Ronald, who has been called the father of social investment. He's also been called the father of British venture capital. So he's had at least two kids. I don't know how many others he's had. You don't really need me to introduce him. Sir Ronald Coe, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Evan. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle uh, and Phil. Thank you all for coming here this evening. Uh, you are the people who have been the movers and shakers of social investment in Britain. And some of you come because you're the movers and shakers outside of Britain in the United States and also across Europe. But I know the burning question on your mind is why do I put all the organizations I try to help in a basement? And the reason is very simple. You can only move up from there. <laughs> it gives you fantastic motivation to go out and tackle the highest peaks. After living in one of those basements for six months or a year or more, you're raring to go out there and prove what you can do. And I must say that while uh, Phil has been extremely generous in his praise of me, the reality is that it is Phil and Michelle and the team who have turned what seemed to be a persuasive vision into a convincing reality. And before we come to discuss that, I'd like to very warmly welcome Al Gore, who is one of the most thoughtful persons that I have had the opportunity to meet. And it's an honor for all of us that you've been able to join us uh, today and uh, that uh, you've allowed us to share the platform uh, with you. Now, what I would also like to say is that politicians have had a tremendous role in making social investment happen. It's not often that politicians have an opportunity to really move the needle. And I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Sir Jeremy Hayward of Number 10 and of Nick Hurd, who is the Minister at the Cabinet Office, who has been particularly responsible working with Francis Maud for the development of social investment. And many of the initiatives that uh, we're going to be considering today, including Big Society Capital, welcome Nick O'Donoghue, who is its uh, CEO, would not be here if politicians had not understood the major issues that we faced and grabbed new and innovative ways to tackle them. And we're here to consider this proposition. Capitalism has been the most effective way that mankind has been able to devise, or womankind uh, for that matter, uh, in creating growth and innovation. And yet, although it has tried to adapt to the reality which Evan referred to, that it doesn't really deal with its social consequences well or well enough, Although it has tried through charitable giving and the development of foundations that have benefited from many of you here in, in this room come from foundations, have benefited from tax advantages so that they are able to achieve greater social impact. And although government has come in and tried to improve the lives of those citizens who are left behind through developments like the welfare state, nevertheless, we live in societies which, as they grow and improve the average standard of living, create increasing inequality between those who are successful and those who are left behind. And the persistence of these problems seems to become institutionalized. As uh, Philip Larkin said, it's as if man hands on misery to man. Those who are left behind are left permanently stuck behind. And it is almost impossible for charitable giving or for government to pull them out of the mire of disadvantage in which they are stuck. And I have been privileged over the last uh, 12 years to focus on this issue. And what I have discovered is that between the private sector and the public sector, there is a social sector which is considerable in size. In the case of the UK, it has 100 billion pounds of foundation assets. 
It has 700,000 people working in charitable organizations. In the case of the US, it has $700 billion of foundation assets. It has 10 million people working in not-for-profit organizations. And across the EU, we have representatives of uh, EU organizations here today. In the case of the EU, there are 11 million people working in not-for-profits across Europe. And yet, as you know better than I in many cases, what is the common characteristic of the social sector? The common characteristic is that there is insufficient money to make it through the next three months. That relying on donations makes it almost impossible to scale up an organization so as to move the needle on a social issue. And so we began to think about harnessing those forces that have made capitalism so effective in creating wealth to deal with social issues. And we've come to realize that social entrepreneurship, if it can be harnessed, and capital markets, if they can be harnessed, could really begin to bring about a systemic change in the way in which capitalist society deals with social issues. Systemic in the same sense that business entrepreneurship turned out to be systemic, by changing the mindset, the mindset of government, about how you go about creating growth in the economy. There was a time in Britain when it was thought that it was through greater government involvement. The whole motor industry was consolidated, subsequently nationalized, eventually went bust. Governments moved from that type of thinking to saying, we have as governments to provide scope for innovation and growth. And you do that by stimulating entrepreneurship. Institutional investors had traditionally thought that they would only invest in public securities. They began to think that they ought to make an allocation to venture capital, where I started out, and private equity, and alternative investments. And their mindset changed. And individuals and corporations, when Microsoft and Apple overtook IBM, the whole corporate world began to think about whether it had the correct top-down approach to innovation, and its own mindset changed. And individuals. When I started out in uh, 1972 uh, with what became Apex, the word entrepreneur was, could hardly be spelt in, in Britain. And the word venture capitalist uh, didn't exist. Some of you will have heard the story of a friend of mine who, who went to introduce his kid to the headmaster of his new school. And uh, asked, uh, the headmaster asked the kid, what does your father do, Sonny? And the kid answered, oh, he's an adventure copulist. <laughs> that, that, was the level, that was the level of understanding. And yet today, the status of an entrepreneur is probably higher than the status of a corporate executive, certainly of a successful entrepreneur. And so the question before us today is can we use social entrepreneurship? Can we use the capital markets in such a way that we can bring about the same change of mindset, the same change of priorities? And the answer that I would give is yes, certainly it can. We can see and you have seen outside multiple examples now of people within the social sector and from outside the social sector who are driven by a desire not just to do well for themselves, but by a social mission, who realize that fulfillment for them comes from doing something for others as well as themselves. And that is a very powerful motivating force. The milestones that we have passed on the way include Bridges, because Bridges was the first attempt. Charity Bank was created in, in the same year uh, and is another attempt to bring capital to bear on social issues in ways that use the traditional drivers of capitalism. And Bridges helped to bring the reality home that there is not necessarily a trade-off between social return and financial return, that the two can go hand in hand. We will hear from uh, Al Gore later that in many cases, they can even outstrip the performance 
of normal companies that have less of a social objective. Another milestone was the creation of social finance and the development of the social impact bond. For the first time, we can read across from the social performance of a social organization, an improvement in the rate of recidivism in the case of the Peterborough bond, to a financial return, which is funded by the savings that come to the state or the revenues that accrue to the state from improving somebody's life. For the first time, a social entrepreneur can say, if I can achieve a 10% improvement in the dropout rate from school, I can pay out 8 or 10% on my bond. If I can reduce the rate of homelessness by 10%, I can do the same. Or if I want to try to help a particularly disadvantaged group, if I can put together the metrics for measuring my social performance, I can access the capital market. We pointed out at the time that social returns do not attract capital in the way that financial returns do. And that it was necessary, therefore, to create a system to support social investment. And that an integral part of the system was the creation of a social investment bank with enough capital that it is able to fund social entrepreneurships and social, uh, social entrepreneurship and social organizations. And I'm delighted to say that our government here accepted the proposition that unclaimed assets lying for 15 years or more in bank accounts of the major banks and building societies in our country, where banks and building societies have made an effort to reunite them, an unsuccessful effort to reunite them uh, with their owners, should be devoted to the equity of a social investment bank. And we have almost cleared the final hurdle to receive 400 million pounds over the next three or four years of unclaimed assets in the UK. And the four leading banks in the UK have provided 200 million pounds of equity in addition. And we have ambitious plans at Big Society Capital to support social entrepreneurs like Phil and Michelle and the team at Bridges, like many of you here this evening. We have ambitious plans to underwrite social uh, securities in the same way that normal financial securities are underwritten, to be cornerstone investors in funds, to allow a host of financial intermediaries to have the capital that's needed in order to move the needle on social issues. And so, as I hand over the baton to Peter Englander, with whom I've worked for more than 30 years and who played a huge role in building up Apex and in building up Bridges, my answer to you all is an emphatic yes. Capitalism can serve society better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now you've made... You've made one very strong statement, which is a, an important statement, that there's no, or there doesn't have to be, a trade-off between social and commercial return. Now that's amazing, if true, because you're constraining yourself when you invest looking for a commercial, uh, looking for a social return. So give us the theory as to why it would be that there wouldn't be a trade-off between those two. Well, first of all, I'm saying that there is not necessarily a trade-off. Right, yes. not, I'm, not, trade yeah. I'm not advocating that there should be no trade-off. I think the field of social investment involves a whole spectrum that goes from traditional philanthropy, which you begin to perceive as the first layer of equity in a social organization, all the way through to investments in funds like Bridges Funds or Generation Funds, which can achieve market rates or close to market rates of return. Along that spectrum, you'll have social entrepreneurs funds that will achieve four or five percent only, but will enable social entrepreneurs to achieve sustainable organizations. Big society capital, right. which will be funding them, is looking for four or five percent. You'll have social impact bonds, which perhaps will achieve a seven or eight percent rate of return, and you'll have different innovative vehicles created to invest in social organizations which will cover the whole range right. of return. But at the end, 
there's a whole bunch of them that are giving you ordinary commercial returns that are overlooked by a traditional venture or capital market. It's certainly important to realize that the supply of capital creates its own demand. Right. To the extent that we can manage to bring about these powerful pools of capital, entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs included, will come out and, and, and take that money. Now, Bridges focused on entrepreneurs only in the poorest 25% of the country. No private equity firm had an objective like that one. Bridges ought to be followed today by another five or six organizations that try to do the same thing. And we're very interested at Big Society Capital in seeing how we can help them to achieve that. So you're right, there is a whole host of opportunities that could deliver financial but the returns. market failure, I'm trying to get my finger on the market, the market failure is that there, there are virtuous circles and vicious circles. So if you deprive a segment of society of capital, there will be no good opportunities in that segment. It will become self-reinforcing. And if you offer capital, it then generates, it, it's, the, it's the line that it generates its own demands. Good, Correct. well, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on that later. Thank you very okay. much, Sir Ronald. If you go down, yes, you're, 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 no, good, good.